Hey, what's up, Super Simps, and welcome back to another episode of Simply Pod Logical, a Simply Neological podcast. Hello. Today we're talking about Britney Spears and true crime. What those two things have to do with each other, you'll find out on this episode <laughs> of Simply Pod Logical. <laughs> yes. Uh, is today's episode brought to you by Holo Taco? Sure. Uh, yeah. Whether it is or not, you can go to <laughs> www.holotaco.com, and if you have boring nails, it's not a problem anymore. We're sold out of the Unicorn Dream collection sets, though. Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. But there's individuals still available. There's still lots mm -hmm. of exciting stuff there, and we want you to get excited about your life. And your nails. <laughs> oh, you're by your, what are you, Dr. Phil? <laughs> I am Dr. Phil. He should be our, like, uh, celebrity spokesperson. How much do you think we'd have to pay him to uh, be a... He'd have to pay me. To be a... It's not happening. <laughs> All right, Britney Spears. We finally got around to watching the Britney Spears documentary. It's called Framing Britney Spears. It it's was hard to find in Canada. But... That's the thing. So it was a New York Times production, but it aired on FX, whatever that is. Special and effects? And it took a know. long time to find a way to legally watch it in Canada. Eventually it was on Crave. She wanted to take like 30 seconds to go on a tangent and complain about how many different streaming services there are. You know, like streaming <laughs> services were supposed to restore order. They were supposed to... So they were supposed to bring balance to the content universe. Well, they're supposed to streamline. Isn't that the point? Which means, you know, have less of many things and just yeah. have one or a few things. Like, I don't want Disney just because I could watch one show about Baby Yoda and now I need Crave and 90% of Netflix content is not good. So I'm paying for that just for the occasional good thing. It's, I hate it. It's basically just it's becoming a monster it's snowballing into just replacing cable by having to choose like 20 different packages of streaming services i've fallen into the trap because i i subscribe to like four different scre streaming services <laughs> <laughs> anyway Oops. so we watched the britney spears one uh really interesting obviously it got a lot of attention in the last few weeks mm -hmm. And uh, I guess I'll just give a very brief recap, but we'll sort of just touch on the major points that have led to like why people are so interested in it, right? So it, it covers Britney Spears' rise to fame as a young girl, grew up in the middle of nowhere, America. Uh, her parents, I guess, recognized she was talented and kind of to their great expense, even though they didn't have a lot of money, tried to make her famous, right? So like they kind of like shipped her off to New York at a pretty young age. She was in the Mickey Mouse Club for a while. Uh, and yeah, I, I think even from that initial beginning, there's sort of this lingering feeling of like parents who want to make money off child stars. Like they don't really get into that so much, but I think there's definitely an aspect of that. Mm -hmm. That was at the back of my mind anyway. Um, uh, she gets really famous. It's really interesting to see they have footage of her like performing in malls before people like really knew who she was. And I think that was a, a common thing when we were teenagers that like aspiring pop stars would just like show up at your local mall mm -hmm. to sing to a crowd of like people who are mostly just walking by confused why yeah. there's someone singing <laughs> there. And it's really interesting to see how like quickly she blew up and went from like performing to like nobody at a mall. So all of a sudden she is like the biggest female pop star in the world at a time mm -hmm. where most uh, popular music with young teenagers were boy bands more than girls. It was very much mm -hmm. a boy band world when she came onto the scene. Uh, I guess where the documentary I think really gets interesting is in uh, two aspects. It's how the media treated her and both media and paparazzi being a big part of that. And that has been a lot of the discussion after the fact. And then her eventual uh, mental breakdown, I guess we'll call it, and her now being under a conservator conservatorship, mm -hmm. which she has been for quite a while, which basically means that uh, she was declared like not mentally capable of taking care of herself. Uh, so they had to the court appointed someone to make decisions in her best interest, who in this case is her father. And there's a lot of controversy around this because obviously there's a lot of money to be made off of Britney Spears, the business of Britney Spears. So there's an obvious potential for a conflict of interest that the person who can control what she does with her life and make decisions on her behalf, her father, also has a huge financial interest mm -hmm. in what she does with her life. And Britney Spears herself has expressed through court uh, motions with her lawyer that she does not want her father to play that role in her life. 
even if she accepts that she needs someone a, like she i think she has accepted she needs a conservator or she's okay with having one but she really doesn't want it to be her dad so the whole free britney movement has sort of coalesced around that storyline too maybe let's start with the media piece because i think that's the first one people picked up on and i've noticed sort of like two uh, different sort of reactions i'm seeing to this one is look how crazy it was how media treated a female celebrity at that time mm -hmm. and how like strange that would seem today. But then you see other people s saying like, well, maybe it's not that different now. We still see paparazzi following and harassing uh, Addison Ray, some big TikTok star mm -hmm. who maybe broke up with her boyfriend too. And, you know, like, so I, I guess maybe there's some nuance to this. W what is the takeaway? Is it that women are just, uh, harassed by the media machine and held to a different standard than men like she was clearly held to a different standard than Justin Timberlake her boyfriend or has there actually been a pretty significant shift in a young female pop singer today sitting down for an interview wouldn't be asked questions about her virginity like Britney Spears was 20 mm -hmm. years ago those are all good questions. I think I would agree that the the paparazzi's impact on Britney Spears' mental health and just like life and existence as a person is what resonated the most with me because I remember growing up idolizing Britney Spears like a lot sure. of other um, women my age. And it that storyline of being hounded by the paparazzi, which became a storyline in, in more recent years, wasn't obvious to me as a 16 year old, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm just seeing the product of that hounding of her. I'm seeing all the like in style 17 or whatever magazines that just have paparazzi pictures of like stars. They're just like us. And it's Britney, I don't know, tripping on the sidewalk or something yeah. or grocery shopping. And you can tell looking back now that so much of her life is documented in a way that it's like, come on, guys, like, let her go get her smoothie. <laughs> and there, there's yeah. way worse examples. That that's just like regular life stuff. But I feel bad, personally, for just being, you know, a 16 year old looking at all these mag magazines and being like, yeah, oh, my God, what did she do last weekend? Let's read it. And, you know, getting together with my girlfriends, sharing this magazine. Oh, have you seen this yet? And I didn't have the the insight at the time. And couldn't have been expected to have that insight at the time either to really understand um, what I do today, which is like celebrities are people too, stars, they're just like us, except take that meaning to a deeper level and really think about it is kind of the irony uh, in some of those headlines that I recall now. And I just like on a personal note, having a tiny fraction of the amount of fame that Britney Spears has. Obviously, the paparazzi mm -hmm. does not hound simply in illogical. <laughs> no. I'm just saying that. But I have a tiny bit of exposure to, you know, fans uh, screaming at me or wanting my picture or autograph. So there's mm -hmm. a little bit of experience. And the level she was on is something that I cannot even comprehend. Like I, as it is, have anxiety when I've been in uh, crowds of a few hundred or a thousand. Mm -hmm. And the amount of damage that can do to her self-esteem, her self-perception, and just like how to operate with other people, I think, how to talk to others after that. Mm -hmm. I can't even imagine how much of an impact that was. So there's a part of me that feels bad for almost just participating in all of this because just by nature of buying these magazines, I guess I was a participant. And then there's the other part of me that I didn't know this. I didn't fully understand or appreciate it. And I believed that I was a fan. Like, I, I liked her. I didn't have any negative um, vibes or intentions in her story when I was a young girl. Like, I wanted to see her do well. I wasn't part of the crowd that uh, was happy when she had her quote-unquote breakdown in the media. Like, that made me sad. And maybe that comes with because I idolized her. I didn't want to see that happened to her. I mean, who, no one was happy. No, what I was think the... there were media, some parts of media were, I don't know if excited is the right word, but they were not mad about this storyline, right? Well, yeah, like, like they knew people cared about it. Mm -hmm. They knew it could get clicks, right? So they were going to cover it in that way. But there were even some parents, like I remember discourse 
from parents, I don't know if this is like through high school, and parents would be like, well, serves her right. She shouldn't have been so crazy or whatever the headline was. Like, but it's just older people picking up on headlines that they're being fed and kind of pa painting, repainting this picture of a young pop star. So, have been so cool. what do you, I have no idea what you're talking about. There Hair? were there were older people when I was a young teenager who would see the headlines about Britney Spears's quote unquote downfall yeah. and say, well, you know, someone someone should have looked after her or yeah. serves her right because she's, you know, she's going crazy or whatever the headlines have fed to them. So there were people who would just like agree with what the narrative uh, was saying at the time. Yeah, I guess it's really weird to look at like talk show clips from that time where they're just like openly mm. mocking the fact that she's clearly having like a mental health crisis. And you'll see like Jay Leno go like, oh, bald Britney Spears attacking people as if it isn't someone like in a real moment of crisis that deserves our empathy and not our ridicule. I, I, I want to think that uh, people, you know, like people on Twitter, the general public would maybe hold people a little bit more accountable if they were to just openly mock mm -hmm. a, a celebrity going through that. But there's still definitely that tendency and the paparazzi thing hasn't really changed. I guess the difficult thing is like when you have people like the Kardashians who are literally uh, coordinating with paparazzi, like they want to be followed mm -hmm. and have pictures taken of them. It sort of blurs the picture of how, uh, whether celebrities have some responsive, like it's not just a clear relationship of paparazzi hounding celebrities, right? If they're also sort of participating in that game. But yeah, clearly, like they interview a guy who was taking pictures of her and like the guy who was taking pictures of her the night she shaved her head and attacked uh, some uh, paparazzi with a umbrella, I think, right? Mm -hmm. And the guy seems to have like no self-awareness that no. he actively contributed to this woman having a mental health crisis. Or he has, ju he has rationalized or justified in his mind that you know, if it wasn't me taking those pictures, it just would have been someone else. Mm -hmm. I don't think we really contributed to the problem. We were asking if she was okay. Like she's going through a divorce. She can't see her kids. Mm -hmm. And you have people flashing pictures in her face, just clearly tormenting her. How those people can do that and sleep at night, I don't understand. I don't expect paparazzi to be experts in mental health or have training in crisis counseling, right? Like, you don't expect them to know for certain what someone's behavior is actually a reflection of. At the same time, it's so clear in some of the paparazzi they interviewed that they just prioritize their paycheck over the well-being of others. And I think you don't need to be an expert in mental health or observing other people's behaviors to know that something wasn't right. And that's just my kind of hindsight reflection on after having seen footage of that. And I think in a lot of celebrity stories where you hear a, a paparazzi reflect on something to the effect of, oh, I have the right to take all these pictures because they are public people and mm -hmm. everything they do in their life that is in public, I have the right to take that shot, capture that video and publish it and make as much money as I possibly can because that's my livelihood. And I think that's an attitude. Um, I don't like that attitude, but you hear that a lot. And I'd, I'll, I'd almost be interested in the perspective of uh, a paparazzi who can give that a bit deeper thought. Like, does it go any deeper than just, I need to get my paycheck? Yeah, I, I don't know. We're not interviewing someone who does yeah, this for a living. Not. But <laughs> yeah, like I said, I, my perspective is I think these people have convinced themselves that what they're mm -hmm. doing isn't terrible. Whereas deep down, I think they know... And if it was someone they actually loved and cared about, they would recognize how toxic yes. a thing it is. That's a good point. Like, if it was your sister, would you behave the same way? And the answer is probably no. Hmm. All right. So the media attention thing, I, I guess we should at least touch on the Justin Timberlake aspect of this, because a lot of mm -hmm. what came out of the reaction to this documentary was anger at him. Because so... Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake were in a very public relationship. They were like pop royalty at the time. Uh, and when they broke up, Justin Timberlake basically, him or his people, management, whatever, used it as an opportunity to like strongly imply that she had cheated on him. And he used that in like the marketing of his solo project after he left NSYNC. 
Crimea River. Yeah, right? he has a music video that implies he caught her cheating on him. Although I don't think anyone ever really confirmed. It doesn't even really matter if that is or isn't the case. Mm -hmm. That's not something you turn into a product, right? I mean, obviously, I disagree with what he did, and he's since apologized. But there are many artists, even today, who take relationships as inspiration for their songs or for their art. So where is the line? Oof, that that is a that's a tough question. There's also a lot of fake relationships in the media too, right? Yeah. So it's not even clear when these things What's are real? or aren't real. But I think if you're going to take the... If it was a true relationship and someone you cared about, even if it didn't end on good terms, to basically spin it to make a bunch of artistic content about how my ex-girlfriend is a slut, like, mm -hmm. I don't see any justification for that, even if she did terrible things to you or cheated on you. It just doesn't make sense. And Justin Timberlake's this weird example of a guy who is seemingly constantly got away from escaping any sort of blowback for being involved in controversial moments where the woman Involving women uh, across from him ends up having huge repercussions for it right mm -hmm. like janet jackson is the other one you're referring to yeah like exactly that super bowl moment which i remember yeah you're yeah right. i mean people are not this is a long time ago now justin mm -hmm. timberlake and janet jackson performed the super bowl at the end he rips off like a boob cover <laughs> and exposes like her nipple had a cover on it but it exposed most of her breast mm -hmm. and this was a really big it's the super bowl it's like the biggest television event in the u.s and they got uh, many letters from people very upset about seeing a woman's breast <laughs> i know yeah in hindsight it's kind of it bit. seems kind of silly now especially when you look at some but the question of consent at the time wasn't made clear, right? Like, and that was the issue because people started blaming her for like, oh, she she obviously had that well, happen on purpose. Well, they clearly both knew what was going to happen. I think he tried to pretend he wasn't really aware of what was well, going the, on. That because didn't the make lyric sense. Of, the, of the song was, I'll have you naked by the end of this song, yeah. right? No, it totally. It everyone like, yeah. knew what was happening, but she got all the flack for yeah. how indecent it was. You're right. It, it all fell on her. All the negativity from that fell on her. Yeah. And any positivity, if like men saw it that way in celebration, they were like, yeah, go Justin. Mm -hmm. So depends on the lens that you saw that moment through. But anyway, this, like, this doesn't mean you have to like hate Justin Timberlake for things he did 20 years ago. Mm hmm but, you know, like, I've, I saw some people arguing, like, you shouldn't be canceling Justin Timberlake over this. Like, no one's canceling Justin Timberlake. They're just trying to point out, like, hey, dude, yeah. it was pretty messed up that you were involved in this. I don't think it's a bad you know. thing to reflect on huge cultural moments like that that we now see differently because of just an evolution of thought. Yeah. So did you ever idolize Justin Timberlake? No, like at all not. a little bit no no I'm, I'm not saying that as uh to try and insult you or anything i mean no, seriously no no, no, no. i there appreciate no it's a genuine question no no but okay. like boys my age weren't watching they weren't weren't uh because like i loved looking at boy boys and then saying yeah because little girls idolized are so no boys idolized the boy man uh, not, I don't think so. But you idolize Britney Spears. Well, like, <laughs> I don't want to reduce her to a sex object, but it's hard to ignore that for boy, when she was very popular, when she came on mm -hmm. the scene with Hit Me Baby One More Time and I'm a Slave For You, mm -hmm. she was like the sex symbol of like 13 year old boys of my generation, right? And I, as a 13 year old girl, like wanted to be her. I remember mm -hmm. her songs were, uh, I used to do dance recitals and every year there'd be like a big recital with our class to a specific song that we'd train all year for and design costumes for. And Hit Me Baby One More Time was one of them and our costume was inspired by her schoolgirl school girl outfit. Yeah. It wasn't as um, uh, sexualized Sexual, yeah. as she her costume was in that video because we were 12. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, but I do have pictures of that, and that's kind of it's it's funny thinking it's back weird. that like we were dancing like her. Uh, we I th well, think I was twelve, but there were girls younger than me um, in that class, and and all we wanted to do was you know be look like and dance like Britney Spears. I think young uh, female celebrities now are still hyper sexualized by our media, probably more now even than younger they... now than they were before. 
yeah, like there's a reason why Billie Eilish, you know, like mm. wants to wear super baggy clothes so people don't comment on her body and it's still not going to stop that from happening. Totally right? see that. <laughs> but I would at least like to think that if she went on some major mainstream talk show, they wouldn't be asking her about uh, whether or not she had a boob job mm -hmm. and at what age she lost her virginity. I, f I feel like we've at least, if there's any progress that has been made in the last 20 years, it seems to me there's a little bit more of an understanding or an evolution or progress in terms of what is not appropriate to ask a young woman, even if she is a celebrity and a public figure. I want to agree with you that that evolution has happened, but I also can't deny that sometimes I think some of that is the product of, you know, the talk show host or their PR people realizing, don't ask this question because you'll be perceived negatively because Twitter will do this to you now. And that now they're thinking about it from a PR lens rather than like, what's the new decent standard that we should be yeah, adhering to? These people to? didn't all of a sudden become decent. They it, just realized yeah. there's some uh, repercussions. Now <laughs> there's just, you know, bigger PR teams for, you know, celebrities who say things on the internet or... Uh, otherwise and they have to think about these things more seriously they have to reconsider their jokes maybe mm -hmm. they have like copy editors checking everything before they're going to say them live all in the interest of let's make sure you don't get canceled and i think this might be a new like career path for some people to actually be assisting in that kind of thing so that's the pessimist in me uh the person who wants to believe in humanity in <laughs> me thinks like there are people who have changed and learned and grown and realized that that's just no longer a nice thing to do to people. <laughs> All right. We should definitely talk about the other um, more substantive aspect of this documentary, which is the Free Britney movement and the fact that she has been under a conservatorship for some time mm -hmm. with her father acting as conservator. Uh, so uh, in some ways, the Free Britney stuff was the least interesting aspect of this documentary to me. I just want to be clear by that. I mean... I think the fact that there is this legal mechanism by which like other people get to decide what she do does with her life and whether or not that is necessary and whether or not there is a conflict of interest with the finances, I think that is all a very legitimate story. And I'm glad that the New York Times and this documentary mm -hmm. is bringing attention to it. It's like really interesting. this might actually lead to some reforms or people revisiting these sort of laws about conservatorships. Mm -hmm. uh, but they give quite a bit of airtime to these fans that are incredibly invested in Britney Spears. And I, I think most of them are well-intentioned, but like they, they'll watch Britney Spears' Instagram and look for secret messages she might be relaying. Mm -hmm. So like there's a famous clip of her saying her favorite Disney princess is this girl. And they, people are making connections like, oh, she chose her because in that Disney movie, she's locked in a castle or something. And it really feels like these people are trying to play 4D chess, but they're kind of just looking for, they know what they're looking for and they're going to find it no matter what Britney Spears puts out, right? Mm -hmm. And in some ways, if we think all that paparazzi and media attention Britney Spears was getting was a bad thing for her, was unhealthy, contributed to her downfall, I wonder if this free Britney movement of all these people paying attention to her personal business and, you know, turning her uh, posts into content and conspiracy theories about it is just a sort of further example of people turning her life into a circus in a way, even if they are well-intentioned. Mm -hmm. I definitely think there's two sides to this, and I wouldn't argue that, you know, only one is true, because I do mm -hmm. think that there is probably an element of heartfelt support from a lot of the fans uh, the, fr behind Free Britney. There's even podcasts like about freeing Britney Spears, yeah. like dedicated mm -hmm. to her. And if you grew up with someone who you idolize and you truly, you know, want to see them succeed and do well in life, I don't think there's any harm in that. And I imagine that Britney Spears is appreciative, generally speaking, of the people who have been truly supportive. Well, this comes up in the doc, actually. Right. So in in some sort of court filing, it said that she thanked her fans for their inform, quote, informed support yeah. of her case of her trying to uh, challenge the conservatorship. I think the Free Britney people read that as she likes that the Free Britney movement but I think the words like, thank you for your informed support to me 
implies maybe she's thanking the people who are just like mm. care about her and interested and know the case but to me that doesn't mean she's thanking the people who are like speculating yeah. on abuse that may or may not be it's happening a good point. behind it was the a scene. very careful word she cho- or her lawyers put in yeah. that proceeding there in so yeah i i agree with you there's nuance here mm-hmm. I, I i don't think there's it's a bad thing that people who genuinely seem to care about her are bringing attention to the fact that she is maybe being exploited by her conservator mm-hmm. her father who is supposed to be making decisions in her best interest and i think it seems kind of crazy that someone in her position who has expressed that she does not want her father to be the conservator but is accepting that she is okay with someone being in that capacity she just wants it to be like a different person or maybe a neutral third party i don't see why the courts are rejecting but wasn't there an appointment of a third party as a co-conservator alongside her father more recently that's true so i don't know if that solves the problem because if you only have two people acting as co-conservators how do they make decisions if there's two of them yeah and there's mm-hmm. like it's not really a good vote you have system. like a conservator for your finances and for your personal decisions there was speculation that her dad was like using access to her children as a sort of like bargaining chip for making her do things mm-hmm. this is just alleged and i don't think there's any that's not substantiated yeah. but yeah, I, I guess I hope what comes out of this is a healthier situation for her. But the truth is, none of us really know what is going on behind the scenes. And one thing a little bit weird about the Free Britney movement to me seems that, like, people just sort of assuming she needs her freedom. Like, you don't know what her mental health is and to what degree she really does need support mm-hmm. in her everyday life that doesn't mean that we're suggesting she needs people to order all of her finances and dictate you know her medical appointments or what she should do with her kids because we don't know either i no. think i think the point is the point is, is that we don't know no no one really knows yeah. so to go out there on the internet and make very specific proclamations about what exactly should happen to Brittany mm-hmm. or in what Uh, like how she should be freed so to speak i don't think is helpful if you're not someone involved in the situation that doesn't mean you can't as a fan support britney spears and just show her love and post fan art of her or send her to her p.o box does she have a p.o box i don't know i'm just (laughs) making that up that doesn't mean like don't publicly just show your support but there is a difference i think between the the kind of far end almost conspiracy theory uh Mm -hmm. like circulating her Yeah, it's just, uh, like, is that just an example of a parasocial relationship? Mm -hmm. And those have not uh, been in her interest as a person having a healthy life. Well, parasocial relationships aren't always bad. So that's where a a relationship is between, like, often a fan and someone who's famous, and it's one-sided. So Mm -hmm. the person who is famous just has no idea that that fan in particular exists and maybe they don't have a direct relationship with them. Uh, those aren't always bad. I mean, as, as we know, <laughs> we have fans and I may not have spoken to every single one of you guys individually, but that doesn't mean that it's an unhealthy relationship just by nature of it being parasocial. I think where the issue can arise in some cases like the Free Britney, more conspiracy leaning ends is where you have people who feel like Britney is sending them coded messages directly to them. <laughs> and some of that is kind of delusional on the part of the fan when like Britney is probably not talking directly mm-hmm. to you. And to the point where it's consuming your life as an individual, that it's all you do, all you think about, you start losing um, like time with the the actual people in your life. It starts uh, taking away from your daily activities or allowing you to function and you start like founding Facebook groups about conspiracies. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's where it can get unhealthy. Mm -hmm. For both the person doing it and also for the person who is the focus Mm -hmm. of that attention too, right? But the the person in that parasocial relationship often doesn't have insight into how it's gotten to an unhealthy or harmful level because they are just Mm -hmm. so invested in that relationship. And I think that's the hardest part. Not that I'm a psychologist or whatever, (laughs) tell someone this is an unhealthy (laughs) parasocial relationship. But I think if you are you know, a super fan of someone. It's something just to 
kind of check yourself every now and then like is it taking away from the quality of your life otherwise especially knowing Mm -hmm. that you're probably not getting anything back uh directly from the person you are invested in the one-sided relationship with yeah so if i could just button this up my perspective is we don't really know what's happening behind the scenes Mm -hmm. i think it's a good thing that there is public attention on this to the extent that there should be oversight that in a pretty unique situation like this where there is a huge financial incentive to be a conservator in her case there should be oversight and there should be attention from people who who keep her best interest in mind and if public attention on that has uh, benefited her in that way that's a good thing But I just don't want to accept that it's necessarily a good thing that she's just getting more attention in fan clubs and conspiracy theories and things like that. I think there is some gray area there. Mm -hmm. Speaking of parasocial relationships, we also watched a documentary on Netflix called Crime Scene, The Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel. So a few weeks ago, you may remember we talked about true crime. We were talking about like what kind of content we watch on YouTube. And Christine mentioned that she watches a lot of like true crime content. But actually true crime. But yeah, actual, like very like objective true crime. And you don't like when it's sensationalized. I basically watch footage of interrogations that (laughs) is just the actual raw footage. And a narrator talks like every five minutes, just giving a little bit of insight into the technique the officer is using, for example. What was that channel called? JCS Criminal Psychology. You know, I've watched, watched like every, every video. single video of theirs now. Please post more. No, I'm just yeah. So, but in that episode, we talked about the fact how we don't like true crime that really sensationalizes cases. Mm-hmm. And when we watched the Cecil Hotel one on Netflix recently, it is maybe the perfect example of bad true crime. So let's get into it a little bit. Uh, Cecil Hotel, the episodes, the series starts by, you know, the sizzle reel of this hotel and they're talking about all the terrible things that have happened there and it's evil. It's like you're about to watch The Shining or something. They're they're basically implying from the intro that there's like evil spirits at this hotel. Mm-hmm. In or, true, that, or that it's cursed. Like there's always bad, yeah. there's people who do drugs there. There's people who die there. And I'm like, or it's like a, a poor, That's you know, exactly. not that good quality. And by the end of the <laughs> series, it's clear that it's like, no, it's just a hotel in a pretty bad area of mm-hmm. downtown Los Angeles that has really cheap rooms. So it attracts a population of people who have drug problems and that are maybe involved in crime. Yeah. Right? So bad things happen in that hotel because of that population. Mm-hmm. And the series like tries to redeem itself with that sort of message at the end that we need to give more like social supports to these people as if it didn't entertain for the first like 80% of the show. That the hotel is like, cursed. Ooh, maybe all the drug addicts are like demons or something. Like, yeah, yeah it, it was it was bonkers. But basically the, the series really revolves around one specific case of someone disappearing at the hotel. Uh, Alyssa Lamb, she's actually a Canadian, a young Canadian woman, was on vacation. Uh, she does have a history of mental health issues, and she started behaving strangely at the hotel. So that she was at a staying in a room at the hotel where you actually shared a room with other people, and there was like a communal, a communal area and bathroom. And I guess she started doing strange things like locking the roommates out of the room and stuff like that so the hotel was just like this is weird we'll just give her her own room uh came out later that she was i think she had stopped taking her medication too and there's some very bizarre surveillance footage of the night she disappeared in that she's acting very strangely in a in a an elevator of the hotel Mm -hmm. she gets on as if she's being followed she's clearly in distress she's pushing buttons the doors aren't closing and then she gets off the elevator and uh, she's never seen alive again. The show really entertains the sort of creepy, mysterious aspect of it, mm-hmm. which like I, I understand, right? Because like this was sort of a viral clip on the internet for, for a long time before there was a documentary about it, right? The last moments you see of her are very compelling in that she's acting super strange. And if you are inclined to believe in supernatural things, 
it's not hard to let your imagination consider there's something spooky going on. But, like, it's very obvious what actually happened to her. Uh, uh, she ended up on the roof of the hotel, probably through a fire escape, crawled into a water tank on top of the hotel and drowned. And that's, like, mm -hmm. a really tragic, awful thing. And so to have this series really entertain the sort of spooky, mysterious aspect of it. And then they gave a lot of attention and airtime, particularly in the second or third episode, to a bunch of YouTubers <laughs> who were really invested in her case. And mm -hmm. they watched the content. They would show up at the hotel after her death. And mm. they're basically like vlogging themselves. Like, yeah. I'm on the roof where she died. This Isn't is so this cool. Yeah. Isn't this crazy? Yeah. This like, I feel creepy here. And it's like, why are you giving these people a platform? It made absolutely no sense why they were contributing to the story. Like, it's not like they were in a critical fashion saying a bunch of internet, uh, a bunch of people on the internet got interested in this story and were just wrong and speculating and falsely accusing people, they presented what these people were thinking as if it was like something deserving of our attention and validity. And I just think my main thing with true crime is I don't think it's bad to enjoy true crime. But I think something you can judge of any true crime content is if you were to sit down with the family of the victim and show them the series. If you created the Cecil Hotel and you sat down with the family of Alyssa Lam and showed them this documentary, would you be able to look them in the face and say you were, mm -hmm. you feel like you did that story justice? And I just feel like this is such an obvious example of a pretty, it's a pretty terrible example of when true crime just goes for the most sensational elements of a story to the detriment of telling a story that does justice to what actually happens. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem with this one in particular is that it's like the truth, the objective truth of what happened in this case wasn't good enough to tell a story with. So, and it wasn't just Netflix, it was before Netflix, you know, YouTubers and a bunch of conspiracy theorists and people who started Facebook groups about the mysterious disappearance of Elisa Lam, Elisa Lam, sorry. And, uh, with a lot of true crime, like my issue as well is people treat the reality as if it wasn't good enough because it's not interesting and they will shift the narrative to something that is more entertaining. Mm -hmm. Now, some people who make, who produce television will say, well, you know, we need to do that in order to appeal to viewers because that's the point of our series is to be entertaining. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but I, it, it irks me so much because no matter what you're doing for entertainment purposes, this is based off of a real tragedy. And I can appreciate the value of some true crime where we are learning about, you know, how the justice system works, how there was a wrongful conviction, how the investigation was flawed and police practices like these things should be shared and people should learn about these things. But when it's about sensationalizing the gruesome nature of the crime or uh, embellishing the truth to make it sound more crazy and enticing. Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of makes me sick. And I think to give more context to why I feel this way, maybe I'll just give a personal story. So I have drastically changed my mind about the way I feel about true crime personally, mm -hmm. because when I was, I don't know, a teenager, I loved CSI. And I'm sure I've said this like years ago at some point because okay. people have asked how I got into criminology. And the truth is I liked shows like CSI. I liked mm -hmm. Dexter that was a fictional show about a serial killer. Mm -hmm. It just intrigued me, this idea of like, well, you know, how do psychopaths think? It's, it's interesting. Sure. And there's nothing wrong with being interested in this and wanting to understand it. But... In my experience, going from just a teenager who thought this is cool to now having two degrees in criminology to working in crime statistics, my feelings about the media and the commodification and commercial commercialization of true crime, which is this real story of someone who was victimized or some tragic event, uh, I have shifted so much and 
the sensationalizing of it now to me it's so clear how much of a disservice that does not just to like directly to the victim and the families involved but to society and the people who consume it because it's not a real reflection of what we should be caring about the most and this doesn't mean that i'm trying to you know tell everyone you can't have fun and you can't watch stories about serial killers like (laughs) dexter's still a good show except the last episode ever the worst episode ever they need to redo that um (laughs) but my opinions on it have changed a lot since since I learned about criminology and crime the, and the true harms and the, the intricacies of the justice system and the idea of inflating or changing the truth just for the purposes of entertainment mm-hmm. uh, makes me feel gross. Yeah. I guess one thing that's sort of, if, if you uh, have taken like criminology courses or you're interested in crime in the media, I think something that is very apparent if you study this at all, it's that uh, one of the major uh, problems with how the media cover crime, covers crime is that it's much, you know, sexier to cover certain types of crimes over mm-hmm. others, even if some things are m- more in the public interest than serial killers, right? So, like, uh, something hugely important is just procedural aspects of the criminal justice system. You know, it's a really big problem now how many people have to wait way too long to actually go to trial, that's not a sexy storyline that someone's going to click on in the paper, right? So there's an obvious bias in how media covers crime that gravitates to the more serious and sensationalized side of things. They also want to appeal to emotion, and that's kind of the goal of the media. So recently I read a headline in Canada about how uh, someone who was convicted of a DUI and had, as a result, killed a family in a a car crash. Uh, Mm -hmm. The headline read like, murderer gets out of jail after four years had killed entire family so your gut reaction to that is that's terrible our justice system has failed us Mm -hmm. right i read more about the case and then i kind of remembered oh yeah i remember that case from however many years ago when it was in the courts but there's so many details that you know the media doesn't want to highlight which is the person was very young when this crime occurred. Uh, the family had actually already spoken to him and there'd been some forgiveness on the part of the family for this tragic, tragic mistake, ultimately. <laughs> this person will never have their license again. This person did very well in prison and has shown immense progress towards their rehabilitation. And there's just so many things that like, well, the media doesn't want to say that because that almost sounds like it's not a good story Mm -hmm. anymore because there's a reason behind all of this the better headline Mm -hmm. is murderer sets free (laughs) yeah and that's not to say you aren't allowed to have an emotional response to a young person driving drunk and killing people like right it's completely justified for that to be something you could have valid anger about and it's not to say the media should not cover those things but you just i think you have to recognize that there is very much a bias in how media covers crime and what crimes they choose to cover based on how sensational they are more than what is, you know, best in terms of informing the public about what they should know about a criminal justice system or what sort of political attention or reform might be necessary for the criminal justice system. Right. To flip back to the documentary, I think you you made a good point there. Although like you, so your examples are a lot of like fictional things, right? But I think it really matters when you're talking about true crime there's no such thing as like a completely objective documentary unless you're literally just watching raw tapes of police interviews Which maybe i do <laughs> well even yeah. those i guess have some sort of framing they're they're yeah. they're choosing which footage to show you too right mm-hmm. so it's not like saying documentarians are objective they are choosing what to show you even if they aren't putting their literal narration on it telling you what to feel but what do we learn from it So like, I guess here, so here's a good example. We also watched, there's a documentary on Netflix about Amanda Knox Mm -hmm. that, uh, so Amanda Knox was a young woman who traveled to Italy. She's like 20 year old American. Uh, she lives with a exchange student from Britain, I guess. And she is hanging out with her Italian boyfriend, comes back to her place in the morning and her roommate is dead. And it's a story about, do you think she was the killer and killed her roommate for some reason? Or did she get swept up in a bad police investigation and the killer is someone else? So, so basically 
the documentary shows you from the perspective of the police and the prosecutor. They talk to Amanda Knox herself about her case and her experience of it. They talk to one of the more prolific people in the media who was covering the case at the time. And it's a really interesting example of all these things. It's, it's a case of very likely, almost certainly false, uh, not false, what's the term? Uh, Falsely accused? Yeah. So wrongful she, conviction? Wrongful conviction, yeah. The, the police clearly made mistakes in their investigation mm -hmm. and were fixated on Amanda Knox as the potential. They had tunnel vision, but I think yeah. a lot of their tunnel vision was based on the media positioning her as the, you know, the overseas villain who had done something in their town. Yeah. So clearly at a certain point, there was a lot of sort of attention on the fact that was the Italian justice system doing justice to this young American girl? And from the perspective of the Italian prosecutors, it's very clear that at a certain point they took it personally that their convicting Amanda Knox was them defending the honor of the mm -hmm. Italian justice system, which is insane and totally unfair to the specific accused in that case. But to bring it back to the media thing we were just discussing, this is a really good example of how the media didn't let the truth and what was like uh, the more objective facts of the case get in the way of a good story. They tried to spin it that like it was sh the murder happened because they were all engaged in some sort of freaky orgy that went wrong, even mm -hmm. though there was no re there was no real reason to think that at all. But you have this guy who was a journalist who defends having done this, basically saying, well, like, if I wasn't going to print it, someone else was. It's my job. I heard the yeah. story somewhere. It's not my job to really confirm if it's true. I just wanted to print the best story. I also can't tell you any of my sources, like well, the guy around the corner. But, like, it, it, they may not be reliable sources, so they can't tell us that either. Sure. I, guess I mean, there's the a point. reason in journalism that you don't give up yeah, your sources. That's not what I meant. But they also, as a result, couldn't confirm if their yeah. sources were reliable or not. Yeah, and but it's like, so what's fascinating about the Amanda Knox thing one? Like, in a nutshell, the Amanda Knox one is about, uh, you know, wrongful conviction. It's about flaws in police investigation, how mm -hmm. the media can reinforce false narratives about specific crimes and crime in general. Sexism. Sexism. And put that next to the Cecil Hotel, which is about spooky hotel woman disappeared. You, you know what I mean? Like, so what's good about the Amanda Knox one is like, uh, it's still interesting. You still have the aspect of the crime. It does, I think, it doesn't do a disservice to the victim of the crime, even though the focus is on the accused. Mm -hmm. And it actually has some insights into how the justice system can work and not work in cases like this. And I think it made a point from the writer's perspective to help the, the viewer differentiate between crime news and crime fiction. So they were kind of showing the viewer the difference here. Whereas with the Cecil Hotel one, like the whole thing was basically crime fiction, like what you were being delivered. Yeah, right? it was like really entertaining the ridiculousness <laughs> yeah. just to benefit from how salacious and enticing that is. Mm -hmm. The only other, I'll quickly bring up uh, another Netflix one because like I think it's proof that you can have a series about serial killers without it just being about the sensational nature of the killings, uh, is the Night Stalker documentary on Netflix. Came out pretty recently, too, about a guy, who a serial killer, who killed a bunch of people in L.A. back in the, I think this was the 70s. And uh, so, like, yeah, it includes a lot of graphic detail about his killings, right? There's an aspect of that, and I'm sure some people are watching just because they like teenage Christine just wanted to hear gruesome mm -hmm. details about murders. Mm -hmm. But really what that documentary does more than anything is it gives you a very intimate look into how a police department and how the lead investigators on that case approached the investigation of a serial killer and trying to catch a serial killer and how much it affected them in their family lives and personally and professionally and just very in a very practical way what sort of went into that investigation so it's not just all about like here are the gruesome details of mm -hmm. how these people were slaughtered which i think would be kind of irresponsible to make content that's just that instead i thought it was actually like a really interesting peek into like what actually goes into catching a serial killer i think that's a good point because i don't want to finish this conversation without 
recognizing that it is possible that some true crime podcasts or, you know, people on the media who have made it their profession to talk about cold cases, it's possible that some of them may have led to uh, more evidence being discovered because of their pursuit of, of this case in particular and their search for evidence. And we know like crowdsourcing, you know, even police are turning to Twitter these days to get more information for things. So I don't want to completely... I hope not. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm not saying it's all valid, but I I, I'm seeing more and more evidence of that happening on the news. Um, or the FBI more recently had done it uh, in the States. But I don't want to suggest that all true crime is, you know, bad because Christine now sees it differently and has a different perspective. I understand the appeal. And I also understand how that appeal has turned into something that can be commoditized, which is why we're seeing more and more Netflix series about true crime. We're seeing more and more YouTubers or podcasts about true crime and i wouldn't necessarily just blanket fault all the you know the stars of these shows because i think a lot of it is fueled by the audience right the audience is dictating what they want to hear and if a youtuber decides to post something that they were in a case they were interested in and they get an overwhelmingly positive response that they want more um then the youtuber might will say well okay, I'll make more. At the end, whether there's an appetite for it or not, I'm not, we're not saying that like true crime has to be educational, mm. but there is, I think there is pretty clearly a responsible and irresponsible way of making content about people's actual victimization. And I think we should be able to call out when people do it badly in a sensationalized way that does a disservice to the case, what is actually true and people who were literally actually victims of crimes. Mm -hmm. Something else I really hate is when... Uh, <laughs> what else <laughs> do you what hate? Else do I hate? <laughs> um, is when cases about, quote unquote, attractive serial killers almost turn into like fetish fetishizations of that person, like the Ted Bundy stuff. I've read and, and seen multiple places that like, Ted Bundy was actually not as charismatic or attractive, described by those who were actually knew him at the time, as, you know, more recent media has portrayed him, like Zac Efron playing him or whatever. Yeah, there's a lot described. of content that seems to imply he's like some super hot, because charming guy. Because that is the right? sexy storyline that women were just drawn to him and couldn't help themselves, when in reality, apparently he wasn't. Like, he tried really hard to get people to follow him and lure him, <laughs> and it took him several attempts. And there were women who did, who just said no and they got away from him mm. because he wasn't that charming. And like, yet we still have people today just unearthing and, you know, talking about Ted Bundy as if he was some, like, hot commodity women couldn't resist and then they got murdered. Yeah. And it's like, that's not the, the that's not the truth. That is mm -hmm. a narrative that has, I don't know, evolved and just grown out of something in the past few decades. But yeah. people are going with it because it's a sexy thing to talk about. So that's another mm -hmm. type of true crime that when I hear people recounting stories that if you actually look at the original research, that was not it i don't yeah. i don't go for that stuff either there is something really strange about uh people who romanticize serial killers too like yeah, that's like a Marilyn whole Manson. other or not Marilyn Manson. Char Marilyn charles manson, manson. <laughs> <laughs> wrong manson well even the, the night stalker guy had yeah. knowing the brutal things he did to people uh, people were showing up at his you know his court hearings his sentencing like fans of his and this is something you see mm. with like any high profile serial killer it has nothing to do with how like sexy they are <laughs> like just some people i don't i don't know i'm not a psychologist i don't know how to explain it mm. but clearly you know there's a population of women who are attracted like i guess it's like the ultimate version of the bad boy mm -hmm. could i just brief on the night stalker one i just think the conclusion of that series is almost humorous in a way because they found out who he was through police work and they, they, they didn't know exactly where he was, but they knew his identity. So they publish his face in the paper. And I guess before the police could grab him, he walks into a convenience store or something, and he sees his face on the paper <laughs> saying, like, this is the guy who has been killing people all over Los Angeles. So he, like, runs out of the store, hops on a bus. But, like, this is, like, the biggest news in the city. So, like, everyone's looking at him like, holy shit, like, that, there's the serial killer. 
And so like he wasn't like eventually a police officer came and got him, but only because a crowd of people in some community in Los Angeles like basically tracked him down and started beating him mm-hmm. and held him for police. So there's there's some like strangely poetic ending to that case in the way where like he was tormenting the people of Los Angeles and the people of Los Angeles Tormented literally him. were the ones who who detained him in a way. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, really, uh, that's that's a series worth watching, I would say. All right. Well, Ben, any more thoughts <laughs> on true crime? As long as it's true, not false crime. We don't... <laughs> you could just make another genre of false crime, you know? I mean, if it's fiction, that's fine. <laughs> just please call it fiction, you know? I don't yeah. like these reinventions of true crime that is just no longer true. Mm-hmm. Well, apologies to Bailey Sarian. We were going to have her on today, but were we, we, we ran out. <laughs> yeah, I think so. You know, in preparing for this, I was trying to see, like, what sort of true crime stuff exists on YouTube. And yeah, it was, I came across her content. I think you are already aware of her. Uh, what's her series called? Like she does Makeup Monday, Make, Murder Mystery yeah, Monday or something. something like where she'll, basically this girl is making content where she'll do her makeup for like half an hour to an hour. And while she's doing it, she's describing in pretty great detail uh, a serial killer or a, a high profile criminal case. And I actually don't really know what to make like it's hugely popular Mm -hmm. she seems like a very sweet person uh but there's something really strange to me about the way she's like she's like i'm sitting across from you i'm my i'm your friend i'm just doing makeup with you intimately talking to the camera and describing like pretty graphic horrific things in a way that just seems so strange to me because it's kind of like she's talking as if she's talking about something that happened at school like did you hear becky uh, I heard Becky was holding hands with Robbie in second period or something. But like she's saying, she's talking about like how some guy was like sexually abused as a child and that's why he turned into a serial killer. It, it seems so strange and jarring to me the way she, the, her delivery of these like incredibly graphic and like extreme, mm-hmm. you know, uh, serious topics. Yeah. Um I'll, I'll just say, I, I don't know her. I haven't spoken to her. I think she seems very nice, and I don't think she has bad intentions. So I don't want oh. people to misinterpret other things I said earlier as, like, <laughs> I'm trying to demonize her content. I am not. I, I don't know. I do think it's interesting, though, and that's a good point, and that's probably something she's reflected on. But I think because she has been doing this for so long, you almost get um, uh, desensitized to reciting, you know, graphic details of, the i don't know 47th true crime story maybe she's reading Mm -hmm. and she's just doing her makeup because she's been pairing those things together for so long so when you do that for so long maybe it doesn't become as much of a a mental uh uh, disconcordance you know as the way when ben first tuned in i know what you mean it is kind of jarring to have the juxtaposition of like I'm just putting on my makeup, you know, whatever in my room. Yeah. Also, this and guy then he, was brutally and then he peeled, murdered. And then he peeled her skin off. Peeled her skin off. <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not, this isn't a criticism. I just be, find it. Wait, I just okay. want to add. I, I do think this, her content in particular is an example almost of an evolution of the type of audience. Because there's always been an audience interested in true crime. Right. Mm-hmm. And more recently, we've gotten this kind of YouTube uh, subscriber audience where people just want to hang out with their YouTuber friend, whether they're doing their makeup, painting their nails, or baking a cake. Mm-hmm. And now they they get to consume both at the same time. So it's a different experience. I understand the appeal, and it might have absolutely appealed to me when I was first drawn to all this stuff, when I was, you know, CSI, what is this? Mm-hmm. And maybe I wanted to do my makeup at the same time. So this isn't... Um, this isn't us saying like we don't like it. I no, just, no, just want to make clear. I just, I am interested in it, and I, the idea of like deconstructing what her content is and that juxtaposition of the applying the makeup beside the true crime details is mm-hmm. interesting to me. Yeah, clearly she found this little niche mm-hmm. that clearly people are drawn to, and it is uh, talking about these you know graphic. Uh, crimes and serial killers 
as if you're at a slumber party with her both doing your makeup sort of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And people have asked me over the years to, to talk about true crime. I've seen mm -hmm. requests for me to paint my nails well talking about a true crime case. Oh. And I think I've made it clear in this episode that's that's just not something I'm comfortable doing because I'm just too close to the field from a professional sense. And I've really uh, changed my own views and perceptions of how I want to talk about this genre. Like it's not, it's not a genre to me, I guess is the point, is mm -hmm. it's a field of study, it's a discipline. And I, I can't make it into a genre for presentation or consumption in that way or, or commodification. I, that part personally um, makes me uncomfortable. Hmm. Personal choice. All right. I guess we'll see you next Taco Tuesday. <laughs> Happy Taco Tuesday. <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Um, anything to link Britney Spears to true crime, Ben? What was that link? <laughs> The Britney Spears link? Yeah. I don't know. I had trouble finding a legal way of watching that show. I think we that... Could, in Canada, you could find it on oh. Crave. It's New York Times. No, like, I, why I are mean, we linking to these things? No, I'm sorry. I mean a link as in uh, linking the two concepts. So oh. if you were to link the Britney Spears <laughs> story to like true crime... Like what link do you want me to refer to? Uh, uh, I think parasocial relationships... Yeah. are evident in both true crime where you have fans who are convinced of a conspiracy theory or whatnot or a sensationalizing Ted Bundy's attractiveness or whatever uh, is similar to Britney Spears having a bunch of fans who kind of maybe go off the deep end a bit with some of their conspiracy theories and sometimes the support can bubble over. Yeah. The other link is we just watched both those things in the last week <laughs> the, the more simple link here i'm like a sociology student Th there's a tie but there's a link between this and this it's uh i'm being reflexive no, your point was much better than mine you're right like in the cecil hotel those youtubers that are way too invested in the case you could say there's a link between you know people who get way too invested in things and the people who are way too invested in britney spears mm-hmm what about people who are way too invested in this podcast? I'm just kidding. No such thing. Uh, <laughs> All right, everybody. I hope you're not way too invested in this podcast. Just a little. Just leave like a little it, like. All we ask for is a little like and subscribe. That, that's it. You don't have to make a Facebook fan group for this. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next Taco Tuesday. Thanks so much for watching. See you all later. Bye. Bye.